For years, fear of rising domestic strife and the potential for a second American Civil War has gripped the United States. And while some dismiss the risk entirely as overblown, the risk does certainly exist. Though, some can't be blamed for feeling it sensationalized. Heck, there's even a movie about it now. There is a widening divide in the social values held by the left and right in the United States to the point that we are reaching irreconcilable differences, and the stakes of power are growing increasingly higher, with neither side willing to concede to the other. And this is highlighted by the fact that chief figures in both major parties are emphasizing more than ever how crucial the upcoming election is. Joe Biden and his supporters call this a war for the soul of America, a fight to save democracy. Trump and his supporters say this is our last chance to save the country and that America will be lost forever if we do not win. I've already spoken about the cycles of power in America and how we are due for a new realignment which would be initiated either by Trump or Biden winning their second terms, and which would forecast the course of the next few decades of the country. One which either way will be defined by a more inward domestic focus, albeit to varying levels, a greater centralization of power within the federal government and likely the executive office, higher investment in public works and services, and a likely shift towards self-sufficiency in energy and manufacturing. Social policy and foreign policy are the key points of contention here and where we see diverging visions for what the future of the United States will be. Whether the result is civil war or utter political demoralization from the losing side of the election, the country's tipping point has been fast approaching since the 2020 election, when both sides of the aisle seemingly became convinced that their opposition cannot be dealt with on a fair playing field. To the Democrats, they believe that Trump, in response to losing, attempted to use violence and terror to change the outcome of the election, while to the Republicans, they believe that Biden and his allies manipulated the election to steal a victory away from Trump. What does this add up to? A great deal of both parties have lost their faith in the authenticity of the election process. They no longer trust their opponents to be good faith actors in power transitions, and clearly there has been no bridge to heal the differences between the two. The natural result then can only be that a losing side in the next election will totally surrender, except that they can't change the system as they desire and collapse as a faction. Or, they will resort to violence. And that is where the risk of civil war comes into play. Hello audience, Mr. Z here with another video for you. If you're new to the channel, welcome. I have videos like this every week, so be sure to subscribe, stay notified, and stay tuned. In the several years of discussing and analyzing the circumstances around a possible second civil war, my most controversial conclusion seems to be that the conservative faction simply does not stand a chance. I say this as someone who has been involved in political circles for some time, as well as acquainted with several people on both sides of the aisle, not to mention studying politics, history, and especially American history for close to a decade by this point. The weaknesses of the right in the event of a second civil war are numerous, and include both physical and psychological limitations. What is meant by the latter is the psychology of the right in America and how likely it is to respond in a civil war scenario. In essence, it is one thing to put a loaded gun in a man's hand and an entirely different thing to expect him to actually fire it, fire it at the right time and place, fire it accurately, and of course, to not fire it at you. The psychological factors can aptly be summed up in a single word, misestimation. Whether it be an overestimation of the right's capabilities or an underestimation of the left's capabilities to just a plain misreading of the likely battlefield, the right is miscalculating in every direction and that bleeds into the actual practical physical aspect of preparing for and fighting a conflict. I'll break this section down into a few segments. There is very much speculation as to how battle lines will be drawn. Will they be between states? Will they be rural versus urban? Will civilians be fighting each other in the streets? Who are the combatants? This all depends heavily on what triggers the war, but the most likely outcome, most especially if the right instigates the war in response to a major political loss, say the 2024 election, will be insurgency against the federal government and military. The reason for this conclusion insofar as a right-wing insurgency is that polarization is most intensely felt on the civilian level, especially on the side of the right wing. We're not likely to see the Republican Party in one voice say we are going to war, nor are we likely to see large numbers of red states secede and declare the federal government illegitimate, though I would not rule that possibility out, especially if manifested on a smaller scale. That is, a few states breaking away in support of a rebel group, or sympathetic states simply providing aid and assistance to the rebels while remaining in the Union. In all likelihood, the spark for war, if triggered by the right, will come from organized civilian groups. Insurgency is the scenario which the vast majority of militant right-wingers have been both physically and mentally preparing for. This is manifest in the fixation upon gun ownership as a challenge to perceive threats of federal tyranny. It is apparent in historic and contemporary right-wing state-level and civilian-level acts of resistance to federal demands. It makes itself clear in right-wing fascination with prepping, survivalism, even homesteading. 
And it must be emphasized that this does not scream conqueror. It whines, please leave me alone which further leads me to suspect that a right-wing insurgency within the United States would not seek to overthrow the government or claim the whole of the country for itself, but more likely than not would be a civilian-level secessionist movement of sorts. I'll get into the specifics of where the most likely locations for such a movement to manifest would be toward the end of the video. The preparations made by the right are all signs of a likely defensive war effort, yet despite this, the rhetoric coming from the right would have you believe that they believe they can win an offensive war of conquest, which will either allow them to change the national regime or give them control of all the country or most of the country. Similarly, you'll hear conservatives criticize the left as being weak, inexperienced in survival, and not well armed as though they were anticipating a scenario in which conservative civilians will be fighting liberal civilians. The left-wing civilian population does not need to fight if right-wing civilians instigate the conflict. They have virtually all national institutions at their back in such a situation. The right seems to think that the left has not been preparing for war just because left-wing civilians don't stock up on guns, ammo, and canned food. But while the right has been preparing for a rebellion, the left has in fact been preparing for war. From screening soldiers for radical beliefs, to pressuring for social justice reform in major police departments, promoting officers based on ideological qualifications, discharging soldiers for refusing to comply with COVID regulations, dominating the mainstream media, buying up millions of acres of farmland across the country, the left, or more accurately, the social liberals of the United States, have gradually been tightening their grip over some of the most strategically valuable institutions in the country for the last several decades. At best, this is the right setting itself up for disappointment, and at worst means the right has no realistic strategy for victory, whether defensive or offensive. In fact, the only realistic offensive strategy at this point would be a political or ideological strategy, not one of civilian preparation for combat. Because the simple fact is that a domestic American insurgency could not stand a chance against the might of the most powerful military on the planet. The sentiment of the statement I have just made has already provoked hundreds if not thousands of critical comments, including potentially on this very video from those who have not bothered to watch this long, citing Vietnam and Afghanistan as perfect examples of the United States military failing to subdue guerrilla movements, that it's all about asymmetrical warfare or fourth generational warfare. But these are false examples. Why did we lose to the Taliban and Viet Cong? How did a bunch of ragtag guerrillas hiding in the forest and mountains defeat America? Well, they didn't. There's like three layers to this, so let me explain. The plain reality is that in Vietnam and Afghanistan, we held military supremacy. We were wiping the floor with both factions as far as military engagements were concerned. The Viet Cong lost anywhere from half a million to just over a million soldiers. The United States lost less than 60,000. The Taliban lost an estimated 60,000 men. The United States lost 2,500. All right, so why don't we control Vietnam or Afghanistan? Because we weren't really at war with the Taliban or the Viet Cong. Let us ask, what was the United States to Afghanistan and Vietnam? What governments did we seek to prop up in these countries? Governments that accurately represented the desires of those people? Did the Afghans choose a corrupt, liberal, democratic regime run by the country's minority populations? Did Vietnam choose a government led by corrupt, westernized elites? From the perspective of your average Afghan or Vietnamese, the United States was nothing more than an invader propping up puppet governments. And while we deride the Viet Cong and Taliban for their anti-American positions, an analysis of their ideologies reveals that both movements were tied to domestic nationalist visions for their countries and people that were shared by much of those countries' populations. What this means is that in Afghanistan and Vietnam, we were not fighting a small group of armed guerrilla soldiers hiding out in the mountains and jungles who just managed to take power after we left. We were at war with the whole of the Afghan and Vietnamese people in a deluded effort to convince them by force to adopt our style of government and values. The Taliban and Viet Cong were not just fringe rebel movements, they were the Afghans and Vietnamese trying to kick out an invader. This is not the same situation in the United States. But some of you will challenge that. Some of you might say, yes, the blue states are basically a foreign country, we are occupied by a foreign government, that is why this is necessary. Any of you who have seen my videos on identity and nationhood within America already understand my position. That the United States is not a singular nation or people, but a variety of peoples with widely different backgrounds and values within a single union, an empire essentially. And in this case, I do agree that often you find one of these nations or regions asserting its authority over an other against its wishes. But still, this is not analogous to Vietnam or Afghanistan, two countries who were removed from the United States by an ocean and who never had any chance of being a permanent part of the United States, who Americans genuinely did not care about one way or the other because they were just so far off in alien places. 
This here, however, this is our backyard. This is not Vietnam, this is not Afghanistan. But there is an analog to this example, and that's where we get to layer 3. Ukraine and its war with Russia are a very applicable example of two similar yet distinct nations in a military contest of independence and conquest, while directly neighboring one another. Suffice to say, much of Ukraine's endurance during this war is largely owed to massive quantities of foreign support, the absence of which would have allowed the much larger, more populated, and more developed country of Russia to absolutely plow through the country. In all likelihood, if a large segment of the United States were to secede, even at the state level, it could be expected that the Union would be the chief recipient of foreign aid, not the rebelling region or regions. American rivals like China and Russia might provide some support if for no other reason than to further destabilize America, but given the likelihood of the rebelling region to be landlocked, the isolated nature of the United States from China and Russia, not to mention the potential risk this could bring of starting a world war, any foreign support for the rebels would pale in comparison to what Ukraine has received. Even still, Ukraine is not a perfect analogy, as the Ukrainians did not secede from Russia in a military rebellion and have had several years to develop their domestic economy and military. Any rebelling region in the United States would be far worse off. I suppose I should also bring up the matter of the American War for Independence, which succeeded for similar reasons to the Taliban and Viet Cong victories of recent memory. Though national identity did factor less in this case, as most Americans had still identified with Britain, but simply felt that being removed by an ocean, Britain was not in a position to effectively govern the United States and was too far off to understand local needs. The British having more pressing matters to attend to locally and not seeing the colonies as all too valuable in the grand scheme of things, simply cut its losses after realizing continuing the colonial war would take more investment than it cared to waste. This would not be the case in the event of an American Civil War, where the federal government will be right there, neighboring the seceded territory and determined to reintegrate it if for nothing else than the purpose of national security. Many on the right will continue to dismiss the threat of the federal military under the belief that the vast majority of the armed forces would defect from the Union to join the rebellion on the basis that most of the military is conservative. Conservative unity is something I will also touch on with more depth further along in the video, but the ideological loyalty of the military is another issue that's multi-layered. First and foremost, while previous generations of military men, that is, older veterans, do lean strongly toward conservative politics, conservatism within the military overall has diminished notably and varies across every branch, with the Marines the second smallest branch being the most conservative. The Army and Air Force are generally regarded to be more conservative leaning, but at this point they, along with the Navy and Coast Guard, are split right about down the middle. This close divide is reinforced by the strong trend the military seemed to take toward moving away from the Republican Party in 2018 and 2020, with Biden seemingly outperforming Trump across military communities by an average of 8 points. This follows a trend of Republican Party affiliation among the active duty military dropping by over 10 points between 2006 and 2014. Suffice to say, there are several holes in the claim that the military holds near unanimous support for right-wing ideology. And as much should have been made apparent by the post-January 6th military lockdown of Washington, D.C. by some 25,000 troops. If ever there might have been a time in which some conservative resistance within the military would have been observable, when the supposedly ultra-conservative soldiers would have questioned their loyalty to the establishment, that would have been the time. And the results speak for themselves. Let's dismiss all of that. Even if we assume that not just a slight majority, but the vast majority of the armed forces were conservative, we're left asking how realistic is it that these enlisted men, likely with families, careers, and plans for the future, will abandon all of that to not just take a political stance, but to make themselves enemies of the state, actively take up arms against the United States and its people, risk the security of their family, and betray their oath to, one, the Constitution of the United States, two, the President of the United States, three, the officers appointed over them, all for a group of guerrilla rebels hiding out in the woods who by this point would have probably already caused a few civilian deaths. What side is our average soldier going to take? In his oath where he pledges to protect America from all threats, foreign and domestic, do you think he's going to suddenly declare the status quo that enlisted him and trained him to be a domestic threat? Or the militant rebels who might share a fragment of his ideology but are killing people, seizing land, and trying to take over the government? Any mass military defection is unlikely to exceed even 20% of the armed forces, and this is being generous. Once the government finds the country to be in a state of war, wide-reaching wartime powers will see to the censoring of any media that paints the rebels in a positive light. And all that any American will hear from the news is that the insurgency are terrorists and murderers, while the military will be bombarded with information and rhetoric about the worst actions the rebels have committed, to sap any trace of sympathy they might have. 
The right-wing rebels would literally have to not kill anyone and not destroy anything to maintain even the shaky sympathy that might exist at present. A kind of bloodless coup or armed march, but everything about that would still be a massive stretch. This is where another factor, public sympathy, will come into play. The right is backing on their faction being supported by a vast majority of the American public. That they'll be welcomed by the civilian population as heroes and liberators, but outside of core areas that they probably already control, the population is going to be afraid and resentful of any such rebel movement. Especially once civilian deaths start mounting, once people start losing family and friends, as rebel activity disrupts day-to-day -day needs, keeps people from going to work, getting paid, paying bills. One of the chief arguments I've seen easily hundreds of times in critical comments is that all the rural right would need to do to win is destroy infrastructure, cut electrical lines, block roads, cease supplies to urban areas, and this is probably one of the most idiotic ideas that could be attempted. The United States is in China during its civil war. The vast majority of its urban areas, most especially along the coast, cannot be starved out. If you block the roads and cease transporting, say, crops to urban areas, hoping this will starve them out, you're locking a door and forgetting a wide open window. Port cities, especially for one of the most valuable countries in the Western world, they will receive aid, they'll receive increased food imports, they will receive military support, and all that will be achieved is that urban areas will be antagonized, and they will turn that anger toward the people responsible and the nearest parcels of arable land to regain a domestic food supply. Think, how will this look to the American public? How will the media frame this? Right-wing terrorists try to starve millions of innocent civilians, humanitarian crisis, they'll say. Nothing will be achieved but to paint a bigger target on the right's back that not just the majority of the American military, but the American public at large will take aim at. A group almost always forgotten in these discussions is the urban right. Conservatives who live in major cities. It can't possibly be that many, right? Look at how blue those cities are. New York City alone has more registered Republicans than the whole of Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, Idaho, Iowa, Kansas, Louisiana, Nebraska, Oklahoma, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, Montana, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Tell me, if you were a right-wing militant, would you starve Utah? Would you try to cripple Oklahoma or Arizona? That's about one and a half million Republicans you're willing to sacrifice to try to starve out your enemies. Are we just supposed to consider them collateral damage? New York has been through blackouts before, and most people get through them all right. But the people who are most vulnerable during them are the sick, the elderly, and of course, infants. If your goal in cutting off a city's power supply is to cripple the population that can fight against you, you are risking the lives of a segment of the population that already poses no threat to you. And if those lives are lost, all that will be achieved is that you have made your opponent much angrier. And with that large conservative population mixed in that has been dismissed, you might just be turning would-be allies into enemies. And there's another group in between all of this that always gets ignored, the suburbs. Cutting off food and electricity to an urban area will affect not just it, but their suburbs as well. Areas that are politically mixed, but who if they are forced to suffer on account of right-wing militants, will easily turn against them. And they will suffer under these circumstances. Suburbs are unnatural creations, they don't have the advantage of being a major port or economic hub with heavy levels of development, nor do they have the self-sufficiency of rural America. Some of them don't even have water systems independent of the city water supply. A right-wing attack on infrastructure will harm this segment of the population far more than the core urban area, and in turn a large population that might have been otherwise somewhat sympathetic to the right will grow to resent and oppose them. The strategies put forward by the right always seem to have this vision of either accomplishing all these goals on their own, or miraculously having everything go right for them, whether it's the military pledging its allegiance en masse to the rebellion, or all the bad guys starving and the good guys being cheered by the public. But all I see here is a reckless rampage that'll do nothing but make enemies and cause needless destruction. The right is not a singular cohesive faction. There are divides across ideological, regional, and religious lines that in some cases are nearly as irreconcilable as the differences between the broad right and left. We often hear about Christian nationalism in the United States as a major faction or facet of right-wing circles, but it too isn't a singular movement. Having two large and separate Catholic and Protestant segments, or perhaps more so high church and low church segments, as in my experience Catholics, Anglicans, Episcopals, Orthodox, and Mormons tend to work closest together with each other, while low church non-denominationals, Baptists, Methodists, and Calvinists find closer kinship with each other. Lutherans typically falling between the two factions, but generally leaning toward the latter. And these groups can be friendly and civil with one another, but do hold extremely contrasting visions for the United States that stem from deeply rooted religious and social values that both sides are extremely resistant to compromise on. 
and if it came down to a matter of power, these factions at present would easily sabotage and turn against each other to ensure they emerge as the dominant group on the right. The faction most eager for rebellion and secession is easily the Low Church faction, and it is largely synonymous with the rural South and Plains region. Ideologically, this region of the country is a hotbed for self-proclaimed American nationalists, it is a major hub, if not THE hub, of Protestant Christian nationalism, and it is perhaps the most densely conservative contiguous region of the country, and much like the South during the First Civil War, it again wants either to have national policy its own way, or to break away and be left alone. Much like in the case of Yugoslav nationalism, American nationalism does not truly exist in a practical sense, outside of being an ambition for control or domination in a union led by the proponent of said nationalism. In the case of Yugoslavia, this was Serbia, and in the case of America, this is the South. When people speak of American nationalism, they'll espouse values like states' rights, constitutionalism, small government, capitalism, maybe even just general anti-modernism or anti-urbanism all hallmarks of southern-style Jeffersonian philosophy that show through and define this faction, but which the high church faction simply does not align with. Ask a real Catholic conservative his vision of American nationalism, and it'll probably entail centralized authority, significantly amending the Constitution or even repealing older amendments, using government power to provide more for the people, regulating business to enforce a strict America-first economy, not an international economy and investing in the improvement of northern urban and suburban communities that most of this population inhabits. Conservative Catholic Latinos across the southwest are a whole different demographic as well, but generally aligned with this, and assuredly enough you'll find the other high church faiths identifying more strongly with this line of policy than the former. Geography has been a major influence on both of these factions, as the low church faction is arguably more isolated from the core left-wing urban centers, whilst the high church faction being brought up among them is more familiar with left-wing policy firsthand, and in some ways has had their attitudes tempered, yet in other ways have become far more ideologically radicalized than their low church counterparts. As a tangent, I'd point out that in the event of a civil war where these factions manage to put aside their differences and successfully coalesce, high churches would probably make excellent generals and strategists familiar with how the opponent thinks, while low churches would make superior soldiers with more survival and potentially combat experience. But I doubt either side would trust the other enough to allow for this type of specialization. Further, if we circle back to a scenario of right-wing rebels attempting to endure a federal onslaught deep within their own territory with the goal of seceding, this would exclude a massive swath of right-wingers living within left-wing states. Why should a conservative New Yorker die so that South Carolina can be free? Why should a conservative from Chicago die for Texas? They're not the same state, they're not the same people, they're not even the same type of conservative. It's like expecting a Shia in Iran to fight a war on behalf of the Sunnis in Saudi Arabia just because they're both conservative Muslims. And this is just speaking on the broad groups within Christian nationalism specifically, which in all fairness does overlap with regional identities quite well, but this isn't even covering the diversity of ideology within the American right. You have conservatives who will disregard faith in the name of economics, conservatives who will disregard economics in the name of government structure, government structure, economics, and faith in the name of ethnicity. The list goes on. None of these factions are going to compromise their own positions for the positions of another faction because many of them won't even consider each other real conservatives. In the minds of many of these factions, their one ideology is the truest form of conservatism and everyone else is more leftist to some degree. So of course they deserve to lead, they deserve to win, and if that means all the other right-wingers don't get what they want, so be it. But they don't realize almost every other faction is thinking the exact same way about them. And thus, all the conservatives throw each other under the bus. Factions aside, let's talk about trust. A lot of conservatives lack it and can demonstrate a massive paranoia in its place. Psychologically, this makes sense. The conservative mindset is rooted in survival and to a degree fear, and heightened paranoia should be expected to go along with that. I have a whole video about that right here. Now, there are probably already in this very comment section several comments saying, fed this, fed that, which in this context doesn't even make sense because I'm opposed to civil conflict. You see, in conservative circles, everyone but you is a fed. And everything that seems like a legitimate right-wing movement that isn't yours, that's just a fed trap. And anything you see online or in the media that isn't exactly what you believe is planted by a fed. The right is extremely quick to label others within their own ranks as feds or federal agents attempting to entrap them into doing something illegal. This speaks a great degree to not only the right's unwillingness to take action at risk of potential consequences, but to their general distrust of one another. I've spoken to one group of right-wingers who call another group feds, I've spoken to the right-wingers in that group who called my initial group feds, repeat that interaction a dozen times over across several different groups, maybe swapping the term fed with controlled opposition or grifter or any other number of terms, and the pattern became clear. 
As far as I could see, all of these groups and their members appeared sincere and genuinely believed what they espoused, maybe save for a few who seemed either to just be along for the ride or more interested in personal gain than actual political change. But nonetheless, normal people involved in politics, mostly just wanting things to get better in their own way. And yet, there was a terrible amount of distrust between groups which so often stemmed from a misunderstanding of each other, and almost a lack of belief that anyone who had conservative views distinct from their own could be authentic. You have so many right-wingers who wouldn't even trust each other enough to go to one another's events, protests, heck, even signing petitions. And yet we're supposed to expect that suddenly every faction of the right is going to come together at just the right time and trust each other as legitimate movements? Let's be frank here. You could have a well-organized militia movement actually making significant gains in some kind of rebellion and sending out videos or messages trying to get other right-wingers to join them. Some conservative, probably with his own stockpile of guns and prepper supplies, would just dismiss it, thinking to himself, Ha! Nice try, Fed. The last major point I'll touch on is drive. Just how much do conservatives actually want to fight? How many are actually willing to fight? You hear a lot of grandstanding and a lot of big talk, but what do actions say? When a state, county, or neighborhood becomes too left-wing, too democratic, how do right-wingers respond? Do they make moves to reassert control over their communities, their homes, for, for many of them the places they have spent the majority of their lives? No. They run away to somewhere more comfortable, somewhere safe, to a little red area where they don't need to fight. There seems to be this amorphous moment in the mind of many on the right that at some point, the government is just going to go too far and conservatives everywhere will rise up to challenge and take back power, but similarly to conservative end goals in a civil war, the lack of clarity on where that line is drawn does not inspire confidence in conservative chances of successful mobilization. The point some conservatives will make is, ah, when they finally come for our guns, that is when we will know they have gone too far. And if that truly is the too far line, there is very little hope for American conservatism, period. In the United States, the right makes some very bold claims. The right will say, the government has facilitated one of the largest genocides in history by allowing abortion. And this isn't too far? The right will say that Trump was cheated out of an election victory and the system is corrupt. And that's not too far. The right says that COVID was a conspiracy to poison us and take away our freedoms. And, and that's not too far. The right says children are being mutilated, we are being replaced, our religion is being suppressed, and none of this is too far. Oh, but my guns, that's, that's sacred. That's when we'll finally wake up. I don't think so. The line of too far was crossed a long time ago and conservatives have done nothing because they lack the drive to fight. Try to think back to an incident of large numbers of right-wingers in the United States coming together to commit violence. If January 6th is the best example you can think of, the right really doesn't stand a chance. What do they even think this is going to look like? That one day the government is just going to send squads of feds to conservative houses to take their guns and they're going to fight them off Ruby Ridge style? What you'll probably see is some gun buyback program for semi-autos and certain types of rifles, and after that program is done, they'll start finding people, and some people might resist that, but most are eventually going to cave when the bills get too high, and finally surrender their guns then. And the few people who let their fines get way too high, well, that's when police will probably put out a warrant for their arrest, or the government might just move to seize their assets, which most people would probably opt to fight in court instead of fight with their guns. So, no. Even stricter gun control won't be enough to motivate a Civil War-sized rebellion. I'll grant this much, the 2024 election does take many right-wing concerns and bundles them into a single event that can rally the right. Whether your concern is gun control, immigration, freedom of speech, religion, abortion, what have you, the election outcome is going to impact that. And this is why the election could actually spark conflict, and I do believe there is a strong possibility for that. But the right isn't explosive. The right burns and fizzles very quickly, which is why I believe that even if rebellion broke out, it would lack the drive and momentum to carry on for very long. Conservatives can barely stand up for their own beliefs in small ways, let alone when life and limb are on the line. How many conservatives are afraid to admit that they voted for Donald Trump in public, to their co-workers or friends or families? How many conservatives are afraid to talk about their personal beliefs because they're afraid to offend or to be cancelled? How many conservatives cave to the pressure they're put under by the rest of society? And we're supposed to expect that enough of them are going to raise up arms against the most powerful country on the planet. People talk about how China is a paper dragon, but American conservatism is a paper elephant. 
American conservatives can be best analogized as a meek husband who complains about his abusive wife and swears up and down that he's going to leave her any day now, but isn't man enough to do it. Nor is he man enough or smart enough to reassert dominance in the relationship. When I set out to make this video, I said I'd try to keep it a certain length, to prevent it from getting too long. I've already gone over that length, and I'm still not done. I'll hit on just a few of those points really quick. The right will deride and underestimate the left to such a cartoonish degree that it gives the impression they know nothing about their opponents, to the point that they seem to think every single person in a blue state is morbidly unhealthy and all conservatives are bodybuilders by comparison. But then you look at a map of obesity rates in America. You look at age trends and find out that the average age among Republicans is around 50, which is about 15 to 20 years higher than the average age for Democrats. Suddenly that fitness disparity flips. The right will flaunt how much territory they control, how much farmland and property they own. But then you look at population density and see how thinly spread out that population is. Like short grass believing it can topple an oak tree. We could speak on resources and food. The most valuable farmland is concentrated not in the south and not in any rugged or mountainous forested areas, but in the midwest and plains, which are extremely vulnerable to conquest. The right says they'll hunker in the rugged wilderness and exhaust the opposition, but the great plains and south are not the mountains of Afghanistan or the jungles of Vietnam. So many conservative states are flat and offer little to no territory for guerrillas to effectively hide and ambush their opponents. North Dakota, Louisiana, Kansas, Indiana, South Carolina, Nebraska, Iowa, even Texas and Florida are among the flattest states in the country. And what does flatland equate to in modern combat? Trenches, attrition, the type of conditions that a rebel insurgency cannot overcome. And that means this valuable cropland in the plains won't stay in conservative hands for very long. The only real exceptions to this rule would be the Appalachian region, the Rockies, and to a lesser extent the Sierra Nevada, all of which are rugged and mountainous but also highly underdeveloped, landlocked, nowhere near as agriculturally fertile as the plains, and geographically isolated from each other. Population loyalties would also probably limit the effective range of any rebellion in these regions to around the Mason-Dixon if not lower for Appalachia, and the border of Canada and the northern borders of Utah and Colorado for the Rockies, as it's doubtful Utah's conservative Mormon population would risk its security to join a rebellion largely led by low church factions and whose chances of winning would be slim, as the Mormons despite their conservative values have a good arrangement with the United States and that their dominance over the state of Utah provides them a great deal of local cultural autonomy, not feeling the same pressure other conservative populations might. And even further, the Mormons have no incentive to sacrifice themselves for low church Protestants, the majority of whom don't even consider the Mormons to be Christian, often deriding them as pagan cultists. The situation in America is not comparable to China's civil war, where peasants comprise the overwhelming majority of the population. The right does not have the same mass support of the masses or peasantry that the Chinese communists had achieved, and which had allowed them to overwhelm the nationalists. America has a large and broad middle class which varies widely in its political loyalty, and which by and large has little desire for conflict. This is not comparable to Spain's civil war, where the right wing had a common faith and tradition of strong centralized authority to unite them behind a singular leader, who diminished the divides between the factions, while inversely the republican faction of the civil war was far more fragmented, literally a coalition that ranged from liberals to communists to anarchists, with each group attempting to secure power for themselves with some factions even pursuing regional autonomy or secession. Heck, in America the factions are basically reversed. I absolutely do not want to see civil war in the United States, for I'm confident it will lead to nothing but needless death, and contrary to what many conservatives believe, this belief that a rebellion will finally bring the right all the power it desires, a failed rebellion in reality would give the left all the social justification it needs to accelerate its own political policies and curtail those of the right. Look to the first civil war here in America. How reckless and needless secession was. How the Democrats could have rebounded politically if only they were willing to cease the expansion of slavery to new states, reevaluate their priorities, and consolidate their northern and southern factions. Choosing to die on this of all hills had cost them everything. Over a quarter of a million southerners killed, their states placed under military occupation, their citizens stripped of their rights for several years, their opposition dominating politics for the next half century, and reshaping the face of the country. There are still countless political pathways to victory, but they aren't grand power plays that create spectacle and achieve nothing of lasting value. What did repealing the Missouri Compromise achieve but to instigate further activism and aggression from abolitionists? What good is this? Political victory is achieved through a long game of strategic and covert moves, but the right has long lacked the patience and unity to make such moves. Every step forward is followed by another step back. Every victory by one faction is undone by another. Every potential advance is questioned and abandoned before it can be made. 
The right cannot survive, let alone win, if it keeps playing as it has. And what would a rebellion be if not just another grandstand, an attempted power play that ultimately fails to achieve its outcome? In the event of a major political loss for the right, and an outcome in which a rebellion doesn't break out, the most likely aftermath would be a mass demoralization on the side of the right wing. As enthusiastic as most conservatives appear to be for the election, many of them are also mentally preparing themselves for disappointment and for an abandoning of politics to just accept the status quo as unchangeable. This would be a critical mistake for the right, as despite the opportunity for a continued Trump administration having passed, the game is not over. The other pieces on the board are mostly useless, so it's time to rethink the strategy, scrap what simply does not work, start thinking less about how your particular faction is going to seize power, and more about how your coalition can defeat your opponent. Put some new pieces in play with better thought behind each one, and promoting any pawns worth keeping. Every single piece must have potential and purpose, because odds are only a fraction of them are going to survive later into the game. Keep as many pathways to victory open as possible, and start building a strong front. Let your opponent fumble, make wrong moves, and when you see a political opportunity, take it. Cautiously. The US of Z thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, do give us a like and subscribe for more videos on history and politics. Mr. Z, out.